woman on this call a happy International Women's Day. Let's keep um, inspiring inclusion. Let's keep giving off our best to inspire the younger generation after us and mentor them to do much more than we have achieved. So today we have very key people on this call to discuss this very important um, topic on International Women's Day. And today we are going to be talking about inspire inclusion, investing in women to accelerate progress. Um, we all know we are in an era where the quest for gender equality and diversity has taken center stage globally. And then it is imperative to invest in women's empowerment and inclusion across all sectors. Um, so today's panel will discuss, as I mentioned earlier, inspiring inclusion, investing in women to accelerate progress. And we aim to dive into this uh, motivated, how it benefits and the strategies that would foster to have an inclusive environment that will not only empower women, but also accelerate collective progress across the board. So today, our panel would explore the barriers that inhibit women's participation and leadership in various fields, from politics to business, and then especially in STEM. After all, we are SP, so. The discussion would also provide insights into effective strategies for dismantling barriers and creating opportunities that encourage and support women's contribution to economic, social, and environmental development. Our panelists are from different diverse backgrounds. We have people from academia, from within the, within industry, the industry, and, and advocacy. advocacy. We also have, also um, okay, I can hear myself. Okay, that's fine. Okay. The host muted me briefly. So today, um, they'll discuss the importance of <clears throat> mentorship, access to education and capital, and then the role of policy in creating an envi enabling environment for women empowerment. Um, so our panel is not just a conversation, but a call to action for leaders and policymakers and all of us to reevaluate and recommit to inclusive practices that uplift women and by extension everyone. So to moderate, in fact, before we start, I would encourage everyone joining this meeting to please keep your mics muted. Unless at the end of the discussion, when you have questions, we'll have the opportunity for everyone to ask questions. So kindly keep your mics muted. Thank you. To help us today in moderating this very important topic, we have a gentleman <clears throat> that I've known for a very long time now, who I've, I don't know any other man who um, champions the cause of women as much as he does. And this person, he's in the person of Mr. Mao Lidake. He's a leading advocate and thought leader on human rights. He's a gender, justice, and international um, lawyer. He's the co-founder of Moremi Initiative for Women's Leadership in Africa. He's also the CEO of Africa Group Consults, which is a premium consultancy firm specialized in providing strategic leadership expertise and policy support services to partners to help maximize their social impacts in Africa. Prior to this, Mali served as a staff of Barack Obama's historic 2008 presidential campaign. He's also a Desmond Tutu fellow. Mali has led a wide range of transformational initiatives in Africa and internationally. He served as lead consultant for the ECOWAS Vision 2020 project, an expert team constituted by the then ECOWAS president to develop the vision for the 15 member countries. 
Molly was also a member of the team of international human rights experts that spearheaded negotiations leading to the establishment of the new UN Human Rights Council. He was an ambassador for UNAIDS Protect the Goal campaign. He served in various capacities with Net Rights, United Nations, WANEP, New Field Foundation, and Public Citizen. He also served as legal advocate for women and children survivors of domestic violence and sexual assaults. And as the first coordinator of the National Coalition on Domestic Violence Legislation. Molly serves on the executive and advisory boards of over a dozen organizations, including Donors for Africa and the Boardroom Africa. He mentors emerging leaders and activists across Africa and has a lifelong commitment to Pan-Africa leadership, excellence and social justice. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Maoli Dake, our moderator for today. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, and, I can hear you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my dear friend and colleague, the kind, ever thoughtful, and professional per excellence, Shina Amoshika, I pay for the introduction. And uh, happy International Women's Day to you all, wherever you are joining from. I know people are joining from different time zones. I am joining you from Accra, Ghana. Uh, so it's good afternoon from here. Uh, it's really an honor for me to moderate this important conversation. And uh, we have many good reasons to celebrate women every day. Uh, but gladly, today is specially dedicated uh, to making it happen. Uh, so thanks for joining the celebration and thanks for joining the conversation. Uh, we truly don't celebrate uh, your many achievements and efforts enough. I, I just left the funeral of a dear friend to come and join this conversation, uh, Edna Kuma, uh, who was the executive director of Africa Women Lawyers Association, a fierce, consistent, dedicated fighter uh, for gender inclusion and gender justice. And it was amazing to hear the many things that um, she had accomplished and her legacy, you know, many of which we never celebrated during her lifetime, uh, but we, we're celebrating her in death. So I am happy that today um, we'll have the opportunity to listen to a few of you share your remarkable journeys. Uh, and in the spirit of that, uh, I'm going to go straight to the introduction of our speakers. Uh, again, it's a diverse panel uh, from different parts of the world. Uh, usually, I'm not a fan of long introductions, but in the spirit of the celebration, uh, it's important to celebrate you. Uh, so I would like to share as much as possible from your long accomplished uh, lives. Uh, so that, pardon me uh, if I spend a bit of time uh, introducing our distinguished speakers. First, uh, we have Kala Masunde Pene. Uh, Carla holds a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and postgraduate qualification in planning and management of environmental and natural resources from the Polytechnic University of Madrid. She embarked on her career at the Mozambican Energy Fund as a research as assistant and development specialist, focusing on renewable energy sources and rural electrification projects to extend electricity to Mozambicans everywhere. She joined ENI, an oil and gas conglomerate in 2012, where she now serves as the environmental coordinator. Over a span of 12 years, she has spearheaded and successfully completed environmental impact assessment projects for exploration campaigns, as well as for the construction of Africa's first floating liquefied natural gas, the yeah. Kurak Sun. Aside her professional achievements, she is a mother to teenage triplets and a sports enthusiast, holding the position of 
with the FIBA, Federation, International Federation of Basketball Commission. Her commitment to community involvement extends to her role as a communications officer of SPE Maputo section and the president of the Chemical Engineering Board at the Mozambican Energy Engineers Order, where she has the distinction of being the first woman to hold this position in the organization's history for over two decades. Thank you so much for joining us, Carla. Next, we have engineer Dr. An Obwebite uh, from Nigeria and the UK. Dr. Anobobite and her BSc in Geology from the University of Calabar in 2005. And followed by a passion for petroleum geology, she pursued a postgraduate diploma in petroleum engineering from the University of Port Harcourt, followed by a master's degree in petroleum engineering from London South Bank University, United Kingdom in 2014. Her unwavering commitment to knowledge acquisition led her to achieve the highest academic qualification PhD in petroleum and gas engineering in 2020, and a second PhD in energy economics, management and policy. She holds a certification as an environmental safety management from the National Registry of Environmental Professionals, USA. She is a current registered engineer and a corporate member of several professional bodies, including the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Society of Petroleum Engineers, WARI, and London Sections. By the way, I'm a Wafarian. And uh, the Institute of Gas Engineers and Managers, UK. I will cut it and just go to Engineer Dr. Oboibite is a senior lecturer at the Department of Petroleum Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, Niger Delta University. She actively supervises and mentors several undergraduate and postgraduate students. And as a delivery focused, goal oriented, and diligent engineer who upholds the principles of professional ethics. She has served the engineering society in various capacities at both divisions and branches. A devoted Christian, Dr. Obwebite is happily married to Dr. Jonathan Obwebite, and they are blessed with three lovely children. Thank you for joining us, Doc. Next, we have Ms. Ina Ajavet Dick. You see, I've been practicing on Javier Digi. It's not okay. like a name. Uh, Ina is an alumna of the University of Leuven, Austria, uh, who embarked on her professional journey at the same university, uh, starting as a geo geothermal projects assistant at the university. Her career then took her to flow self control valve where she garnered invaluable experience as part of the project management team. In 2017, Ina took on the role of reservoir engineer, furthering her career in energy engineering in Vienna, Austria. She, her expertise spans across complex onshore surface and subsurface appraisal and developmental projects. A staunch advocate for diversity and inclusion, Ina, is the founder of the D and I Vienna Basin section. Since May 2020, she has been a leading. She has been leading the SPE Vienna Basin section as its chair, actively initiating and facilitating knowledge exchange and workshop that bridge and energy engineers and scientists worldwide. In November 2022, Ina took on the new challenge as the business development engineer at Steamstex Technologies, where she plays a pivotal role in supporting clients across the globe. Ina continues to make significant contribution to the field in many ways, driven by her passion to make a visible change. 
Thank you so much for joining us, Ina. And now, now last but not the least, we have Oseni Ronki Rubata, natural gas marketing professional. Ronke Ruba Bats is an assistant manager, commercial operations in charge of Ghana gas scheduling and contract management at the Ghana National Gas Company. She is currently the deputy chair, diversity and inclusion Society of Petroleum Engineers Ghana section. Her career in oil and gas sector began in 2021 at the West African Gas Pipeline as a commercial and business personnel, where she assisted in developing the market from foundation volumes of 134 mm to full West African gas pipeline capacity of 474 mm through assessment and negotiation with business opportunities and the use of market. <laughs> Prior to joining Ghana Gas, she served with the Sage Integrated Marine Service Limited, Lagos, Nigeria, where she served as the business development manager. She holds a diploma in business studies, a degree from the Central University of Ghana, and a master of business administration with a particular focus on oil and gas management from Coventry University in the UK. Rubabat has had a strong passion for language and she speaks six languages, Yoruba, English, French, Hausa, Chi, and she even went as far as to st study Mandarin in China. Thank you so much for joining us, Oseni. And uh, with that, uh, we'll go straight to the conversation. Uh, the program is designed to be interactive. Uh, so we will try and make time for everyone to contribute, to ask questions, and to, to en enrich the conversation. My first question will go to Ina. Uh, since the topic for the day is inspiring inclusion, want to inspire inclusion, investing in women to accelerate inclusion, uh, we would like to hear from your experience uh, how you would define inclusion in the, cost, in the context of investing in women uh, and why it is crucial for sustainable developments. Over to you, Ina. Thank you very much. And again, thanks everyone for the time. I'm really happy that I was invited to be part of this panel. Um, I will I will touch on the three uh, most uh, important, uh, in my opinion, most important parts of the inclusion. Uh, firstly, I think in, it enhances economic growth by tapping into the full potential of the workforce. Uh, I think everyone can uh, admit and agree with me that when women are included in the workforce, they bring unique skills, insights, and innovation that contribute to increase productivity and competitiveness. Secondly, um, social development as well is, is quite important by addressing gender disparities, providing equal access to education, healthcare, and economic opportunities empowers women, but not only women, empowers society as well, and leading to improved overall well being for families and communities. Bridging the gender gap uh, is inclusive practice in, in investing in decision making processes. When women have a seat at the table, uh, diverse perspectives are, are considered, resulting in more comprehensive and effective solutions to global challenges. I think it's quite quite uh, noticeable to, to mark here this diversity of thought. I, I'm promoting really a lot. Uh, uh, this one, it's particularly critical in developing sustainable strategies that address complex and interconnected oh, issues. Violent. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay, so we can hear you clearly. Please go ahead. Okay, perfect. Okay, I think someone just uh, just uh, it was unmuted for for a short period. Okay, uh, am I trading the new coins, bonk and all those things? They are really it's up on retro. And whoever is moderating, can you please help us mute those who uh, interrupt? You can mute them from your end. Thank you. Sorry, Ina. Please go. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Um, in my experience, uh, really, um, in 
growing in, in Balkan society, let's say, until my 18th year, uh, I was confronted with the, with the lacking of, of these three aspects. We need to say that, unfortunately, a Balkan society still lives in a um, not in 21st century, let's say at least. Uh, we need we notice a lot of progress, definitely, by uh, very uh, powerful women uh, on the leading positions, which has been improved in uh, uh, in comparison to when I was 18. Let's say it was 14 years ago. So we definitely saw some some progress there, but we really need to. Um, we to promote it even more and such panels as, as this one definitely uh, serve us uh, to spread our word to support women and I'm, I'm just not talking about women I'm, I'm talking as well about gender equality and inclusive environment in the companies in the countries uh, promoting leadership and and bringing this power and diversity of thought uh, in all aspects of our lives Miss Madam Moderator, please mute those who in, interrupt or disrupt. Thank you. Thank you, Carla uh, Ina. Uh, that was a, a broad overview, and I think uh, it gives all of us some understanding and basis to work from uh, when we go into the conversation today. I'll move on to Carla. Uh, and we'd like to hear from your really impressive uh, experience, uh, what you see as some of the most significant barriers to women's inclusion in the economy and in leadership positions today. Thank you, Dick, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank you all for participating in this meeting, interesting topic discussion. And it's an honor to have a so distinguished uh, moderator <laughs> and the distinguished uh, panelists. Okay, so uh, I can share what in my point of view and based on my experience, like they say, um, I consider uh, one of the main uh, um, and most significant barrier, the still work environments and the subtle biases that are still in our working environment. Uh, I can uh, give an example for us uh, women in industry, for example, we still in the work, find working environment which are not prepared to receive women. Just uh, giving one example. <laughs> Um, also talking about uh, mm -hmm. color, women of color, they face uh, even further obstacles in their advancement and as a result, result are even less likely to move into leadership roles. How a key barrier also is uh, being a uh, uh, balancing work and family. It is also challenging and is a factor that limits women from seeking or being offered leadership roles as it requires more commitment, more availability, and uh, even more fl flexibility in terms of working hours, which are not easy to manage, especially if you are married and have children. Um, one uh, other point that I would like to touch is uh, sexual harassment. It is also a challenge, and this brings many limitations. Uh, for example, um, the simple thinking that uh, if you are married, uh, your husband thinking that you, the wife can be subject to harassment at workplace, it can give you some limitations in how you uh, make uh, yourself available and uh, uh, available in your workplace and the uh, other activities that you are involved in. Um, well, in my experience in Mozambique, uh, I would like to share that, however, um, in spite of all these challenges, uh, we are in a good path. Uh, uh, our country is uh, one of the 
Kant is well positioned in, in terms of, for example, when women in parliament and in government, we have uh, around the more than 40% of women. <laughs> this morning I was in the Women's Day event in my company here and um, uh, we have 30% uh, of women working and uh, this same is the same percentage of women in managerial position. So recognition by men in, uh, of leadership skills of women is an essential uh, step to reduce these barriers to women inclusion in economy and leadership position today. Thank you. You are in mute. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. Um, it's always depressing and overwhelming to hear the many challenges uh, that you face uh, just in your desire to serve and to contribute and to benefit from society. But I'm happy that uh, you concluded your opening remark with what is also happening to change that. Um, uh, fighting back, resisting, uh, pushing for new systems and dynamics and laws. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. We'll move to Dr. Ann. Uh, Dr. Ann. Uh, we have seen your experience from different sectors and in different leadership roles. And uh, so we'd like to hear from you what you think uh, the, ro what the role that policy and legislation can play uh, in facilitating inclusion of women in various sectors, uh, particularly your sector. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Thank you so much, Mr. Dake, and good afternoon from Nigeria to everyone on the call and, of course, to my well-esteemed um, panelists. So, policy and legislations play crucial roles in facilitating the inclusion of women in various sectors, be it the academia or wherever you find yourselves, you know, by creates gender equality, equity, and inclusion and adaptation for a more inclusive society. The challenges that we, we find ourselves and some of the things that um, cause women to be segregated or discriminated. So policies and, and laws um, ensure equal opportunity for the women as same as the men. So they ensure equal opportunities in terms of um, equal pay, non-discrimination in the process of um, hiring, uh, during training quarters, even during um, promotions. Yes, they ensure that women are treated equally and they're included in all the quota. They have equal access to education, um, just like the men. Right back home in Nigeria, we have what we call the Labor Act of Nigeria 2000. 2004. No, so this act pre pro prohibits discrimination in employment. You know, so it also promotes work rights. One of our greatest challenges as women. But when you have such laid down laws or policies, like we have the Labour Act 2004, it allows for flexible work arrangements. It actually entitles women to at least 12 weeks of maternity leave. It also ensures that nursing mothers are able to bring their children and are able to have one hour, you know, to be able to breastfeed their child every day. I'm sure in other various um, countries, you know, African countries, we also have same laws that help us to um, break down all those barriers. We have laws that encourage representation of women representation of women like we have the the protocol to the african charter on on human and and people's rights that was adopted by the african union in maputo 2003 we have the national gender policy that was adopted here in my country and that formulated the 35 percent affirmative action just in line with the united nations beijing um declaration so it, it calls for or it demands a 35 percent inclusion of women right in governance in appointments in public sectors 
basically able to bring you know their voices to bear and their opinions to the table so recently in 2002 the court of law right here in nigeria actually ordered the federal government to enforce this 35 percent affirmative so you see that laws and policies are actually crucial they play crucial roles in facilitating Oh, sorry, they say, and I don't know they carry last, but I think that there's a challenge coming from your connection. Um, so we will go to the next uh, speaker and hopefully uh, you'll be able to join us back. Uh, we go to Rubber Bat and uh, we want to bring it home and hear from you. Uh, we are having all these big conversations. We are talking about inspiring inclusion. We are talking about investing in women. We are talking about accelerating inclusion. But when it really, really boils down to it, uh, what are some immediate actions uh, that individuals, governments, and organizations can take to make these things uh, tangible impact uh, when it comes to inclusion of women? Uh, Robert Bart. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Dake, and Happy International Women's Day to all of us. Um, and this very topic is very, very passionate to me because, as you all know, um, I'm the deputy, I'm the um, DNI chair for SPA Ghana. And promoting inclusion of women requires a multi dimensional mm. approach involving individuals, organizations, and government. Um, what I believe we need to do as individuals, organizations, and government includes education and awareness, um, equal opportunities to women in the industry. We also need to do something with regards to support, uh, to support uh, mentorship and network. And we also need to have what we call the work-life balance. So I'm going to start with regards to the education and awareness. Um, as individuals, we need to educate ourselves and others about the importance of gender equality that benefits women in organizations at home or wherever we find ourselves as women. And I also believe that organizations can actually conduct awareness programs such as um, workshops to actually educate and spearhead these um, discussions at workplace. What I believe the government can do is actually to implement policies. So let's say policies actually encourage um, girls with regards to STEM or probably encourage young girls to go to school and then all those incentives actually brings um, women um, up to power with their male counterparts. That's what I believe needs to be done in regards to what an individual can do, what an organization can do, and what an employer can do, I mean, and what a government can do. With regards to equal opportunity, um, I believe as individuals, we need to advocate for equal opportunity in, um, with regards to women. We are asking for equal opportunity, not with regards to a man and a woman being equal. We are only saying that um, we want equal opportunity for a man, um, equal opportunity given to a man to be given to a woman. So for instance, if you have a female, a male engineer, it's very spot on to send the, the male engineer to the rig. But when it comes to a, a female engineer, we're like, oh, she's a woman, you know, all those inyendos start coming in. And we are saying that, no, as far as a man and a woman can sit in the classroom to study the same engineering, say, be it mechanical, electrical, and, and all that, we want that same equal opportunity to be given to the same woman when it comes to work. So we are saying with regards to leadership role, oh, we shouldn't be like, oh, we don't need women because women come with so much drama. We have seen, and studies are actually proven with regards to Mackenzie Day, their research saying that any organization that has women at the ends of affairs, they tend to actually um, um, increase their revenue, they tend to actually increase their profitability, and also the organizations actually last and do well. A typical example is Pepsi um, India and Pepsi America, where they have a female um, MD, and we, can, we could all act, um, testify to the growth of Pepsi worldwide. They made good profits simply because they had they had a woman at the ends of affair. Not, not um, downplaying the fact that if a man is there, nothing will go wrong. We're only saying that giving a woman an opportunity actually keeps them, you know, we have that instinct of 
looking at things in a different way and we're asking for that opportunity at that length. So we are not competing with the member regards to who is ahead at home. We are only requesting, we are only um, propagating the opportunity at workplace, at school, at leadership role. With regards to uh, mentorship and networking, it is very important as women to actually take this very serious because trust me, you might never know when an opportunity will come on and then boom, you're on it. Mentorship, we need to look at people we want to, uh, we want to choose as our role models, follow their footsteps, or even seek um, their advice or their guidance on whatever role we want to play. Being a woman is hard enough because I can tell you in 30 days, in a month, we have to go through two weeks of crazy cycle, maybe one week of you know going through a period, another one week of having uh, mood swings and all that. And during this 30 period, we still have to deal with the male counterparts, our husbands, our kids, colleagues at work. These are really, really difficult. So I'm going to infuse this thing called work-life balance. As women, we need to actually understand that we need to balance our work and our lifestyle, you know, oh, some women are there, all they have to do is work, 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 work. But as a, as a woman, take time off your busy schedules and take care of yourself. Because once you are able to take care of yourself and you have, you are able to, to see things in a different way. And that can also lead to you asking, you know, um, getting approval for a flexible work uh, um, 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 work arrangements, which can actually support an individual to reach their higher goal. So for instance, you can work maybe two days at home or work three days in the office. This flexibility is actually needed for women to be able to progress in, in their, in their um, workspace. So in all, I'm going to say that promoting inclusion in the workplace in, involves a multidimensional approach and we all need to work together, put our hands on the deck and ensure that women are actually doing um, what's best for them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think you, you touch on all the various angles. You, you talked about what we can do as individuals, what we can do as men, what you can do as women, uh, what institutions uh, can put in place, the mechanisms, and what government can do. So thank you so much. Uh, I have been given strict instructions to keep to the time. Uh, so we have just about 10 more minutes for this part of the conversation so that we can open it up. Um, so um, perhaps if we could do like one minute each, uh, moving forward with the next questions. Uh, Ina, we'll come to you and I'll ask you two questions in one. Uh, the first one has to do with, we are talking about inclusion, but we, we've also learned that uh, technology offers some powerful tools and opportunity to help us uh, in these kinds of efforts. Uh, so we, we want to learn from your experience, how do you think we can deploy uh, or utilize uh, technology uh, to promote inclusion of women in the economy? That's one aspect. And also uh, how you think we can use mentorship and networking uh, to impact women's success and inclusion in their respective fields. So it's a two in one. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yes. I will try to stay brief. Um, one thing definitely that changed my life was uh, COVID-19. I need really to mention that one because this is where really uh, uh, energy industry as well started to change from more conservative to new technologies, working from home and so on. At least I can see this trend in Europe really growing and, and still continuing to grow. Uh, remote work is and flexible schedule is definitely a uh, uh, Oseni, you answered partially this question as well and touched on that one. I think a remote work and flexible schedules definitely uh, needs to come into play and need to be uh, uh, seen as something normal, something usual that can be taken uh, two, three days, uh, depending on the company. I am, let's say, very lucky uh, that I can work completely remotely at the moment, and I really enjoy it. I have very flexible schedule and can adapt it on my lifestyle. Um, Again, uh, uh, just uh, uh, correlating to what Oseni mentioned, sometimes it's also up to us, you know, as women, I think it's just, it's genetic and it's also evolutionary that we take too many life roles per day, per week, per month, and we do not recover from them uh, 
uh, appropriately. And then you cannot you cannot be uh, uh, very good at neither of them. You you give maybe fifty percent or even less at all of them and try really to uh, do this. They like to say uh, call it multitasking. It's uh, probably switch tasking, jumping from one to other other uh, task, and then you just you just find yourself uh, nowhere. Um, I think focus is something that I also advise uh, since I started my my platform for resilience uh, last month um, and am uh, also cer certified uh, since three days ago as a resilience trainer. I really try to uh, try to leverage uh, the knowledge about resilience and and worth of focus focusing on one thing and finishing it before before jumping to the other one. It's always not always possible, of course, but yeah, we can definitely contribute to that one. Um, after remote work and flexible schedules, I would say definitely digitalization and uh, training in basic computer skills. Uh, I mentioned Balkan and my origin, uh, origin from Balkan. I live at the moment Austria, in Austria, which is, yeah, let's say more developed. And in that sense, it's seen as as very developed uh, Central European country, but on Balkans uh, we still see a lack of basic computer skills, online communication, and proficiency in using productivity tools. That's something that that we definitely promote. I'm also I will be part uh, very soon on the Bosnian Future Foundation, uh, which is promoting as well uh, this uh, growth or growth of women when it comes to digital skills. You mentioned the networking and mentorship, but this is my favorite topic, definitely. Um, I was confronted uh, with networking and mentorship and lack of mentorship uh, in my early uh, career stages after I finished studies. Um, I was unlucky, let's say, uh, to, or on, on the other hand, also very lucky, and I will tell you why. I um, graduated in 2015 when uh, happened oil downturn in the, in the uh, energy industry. And then, uh, believe me or not, I applied to more than 200 positions in 2015 with no answer at all on any of them. No one wanted to take me as a junior engineer. And this is where, again, this resilience and and uh, um, all, all possible things that I could learn uh, came into play. And uh, and it just made me maybe better. I grew in a in much uh, a more self confident woman, and and yeah, I'm I'm really grateful as well on that opportunity that just made me stronger. Uh, because in the meantime, you know, you need to find your pathway without losing the focus. And focus was always there. Focus one on the career, but it needed to be paused for some time. But networking again, when I joined the industry finally in 2017, um, also I was fortunate to have my manager, which pushed me in that direction of joining SPE from my early junior days and uh, expanded my vision and also um, accelerated my growth and, and my and showcased my potential as well to the broader audience. Uh, which then uh, admitted me really in their in their circles, and then uh, finally in 2022 I was appointed and basically chosen by voting as a SP Vienna Basin section. So this all gives us as well self confidence uh, uh, to be better, you know, to to show our amb ambition and to be um, to be. Uh, included in this diverse environment. Just to mention to you that uh, while I was studying at the University of Zagreb and Leoben, both Croatia and Austria, percentage of women uh, in energy studies was around 12%. So starting early with women, which are, let's say, girls in high schools or even primary schools, educating them what is the energy, how we contribute to the world with sustainable development and providing energy globally is something that's really very important. And this is also, again, uh, um, very fortunately what we can, and we are able to do and promote through SPE. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ina. Uh, when you got to the mentoring and networking session, I could see and feel the passion. Um, and truly that must be coming from a deep place. And, and I share in your passion as well. Um, the organization I co-founded, Morimi, when we started uh, working with young women leaders, before we started, we were trying to understand uh, what are the key challenges that women face in leadership. And we spoke to some of the most outstanding women leaders from across the continent. And every single one of them mentioned the challenge of lack of mentors when they were growing up. 
Uh, so it's a big part of what we do, and I definitely would love to connect with you. Um, you know, you you will, will be a great mentor for many of the young engineers coming up. So we will we'll, we'll connect uh, and see how we can uh, take advantage of this passion and help more young women. Thank you so much, Ina. Uh, we go to Dr. Ann, uh, and I'll also throw two questions at you in the interest of time. Uh, the, the first one, um, has to do with how, no, before we go to Dr. Anna, uh, if Carla, um, let me see. Me Dr. Anna. Yes, Dr. Anna, are you back? We, we lost you during your presentation, your connection went off. Dr. Ann? Okay, uh, so le let's go to Carla. And uh, hopefully we, uh, uh, Sheena, if you're on the call, can you please uh, connect with Dr. Ann to see if she'll be able to reconnect, please. All right, so we go to- so I'll do that. Okay, so great. So we go to Carla. Carla, we're throwing two questions at you as well. Uh, we've talked about investing in women. And from your experience, we would like to know uh, how important it is for financial investment in women-led ventures uh, and what impact uh, this can have on broader economy. Uh, that's one part. And on the second part, uh, we would like to know uh, how, from your experience, we can more actively engage men uh, as allies and advocates uh, in the fights for gender inclusion and equal opportunities at the workplace. Thank you, Carla. Thank you. Um, yes, this is a very key topic uh, and important as well. Well, uh, statistical women in entrepreneurs around the globe, they are creating job, driving prosperity in their community and strengthening industry, commerce, and also you find a lot of women dwelling in research and uh, in development and fueling in innovation. Uh, Women-led business play an essential role in creating jobs and raising the standards of living uh, and boosting inclusive uh, growth. So um, one wise man said one day, you educate one woman, you educate a generation. And this is what we can say about women-led ventures. Um, if you finance uh, women-led ventures, you are uh, leveraging the level of the communities they, where they are inserted. You are contributing to uh, greater education for women and inclusion also, because uh, if uh, a woman is a, uh, able to venture in entrepreneurship, uh, uh, she will be for sure encouraging other women and inspiring uh, so many other women uh, to, um, to invest on themselves, to educate themselves. And this is a key for economy. Uh, and uh, if we do the, uh, that, for sure, we are expanding uh, also gender equality and uh, we will be complying with sustainable development goal number five uh, regarding gender equality. Um, so you also, <laughs> uh, how can we encourage men? Well, for, for sure, I would like to say that men uh, are vital in championing gender equality in the workplace and helping to create an environment which everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed and uh, to thrive. Uh, it's necessary to equip men in leadership position with the knowledge and skills to identify and create opportunities for gender equality and social inclusion in their teams, workplace, and community. And once men are engaged with issues surrounding gender equality and uh, bias, uh, uh, 
in the power of the workforce workforce sector, they will better understand the role they can play to create change. And uh, these leaders, uh, the leaders must be committed uh, to this uh, because uh, this is what to see, what we want to see in their employment. So uh, like um, our colleague Anne said, uh, workshops, awareness session, including men on these topics is essential. The uh, men, they, if they listen actively to women perspective, they can uh, support, be a big support and the key factor in uh, advocating for inclusive uh, uh, practice you. in communities and workplace. Yeah. Thank you so much, Carla. Uh, that's important and I hope uh, uh, you talked about the men listening. So I hope that those of us on the call, we are listening and uh, we'll help us. We we'll hope our friends also to listen. Thank you so much. Um, we are quickly running out of time. Uh, Sheena, were you able to get hold of uh, Dr. Ann? Yes, uh, but her internet is still um, unable okay. to, she says it's not, she's unable to connect. She keeps trying. Okay, so we'll just go to uh, Madam Rubabat. Um, I will also throw two questions at you. Uh, starting first with, um, from your experience, uh, your vast experience, what role do male allies play in fostering an inclusive environment for women in the workplace? Uh, that's part one. And then part two, I would like to know from your, uh, your point of view, uh, what policies and practices need to be put in place to eliminate biases and to promote equal opportunities for women leadership positions? Thank you. If you can do it for us in maximum two minutes, we really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much once again. Um, for me, I work in a mill dominated industry. As you all know, the oil and gas industry is one mill dominated industry. And the mill actually play a crucial role in fostering an inclusive environment for women in the workplace. The mill allies can actually contribute to promoting gender equality and creating a supportive um, work environment. Um, for instance, in my case, I do uh, most of the gas kettling, and this is a, an area where you have mostly men, you can have like 10 men and you have only one woman. And of course, they try to like push you behind. But it's something I understand, I understood right from when I joined the oil and gas industry. So it's, to, it's what I call the boys club. I was able to identify um, my allies, you know, in that organization and I joined the boys club. What I'm trying to say is that as women, when we get to a particular workplace and it is no dominated, we need to actually identify the key people and see how best you can actually join the, the boys club by, you know, by talking to them. Because it's the male allies who will help challenge the bias and stereotypes we face in the industry. It's the same men who amplify the women's voice by actually using their privilege and influence as voices for women in meetings and discussion and decision making. So you need the men to actually amplify women's voice in workplace. Also, the men can actually do what we call, can actually support women with regards to our career advancement. Because there are fewer women and the same women to be like, you know what? Um, they are some kind of special being. They are able to actually advise and guide us on what areas we can do to promote ourselves to be able to, to be seen. So they will usually advocate for equal opportunities, fair treatment, like I said in my earlier presentation. Because, if, uh, because a man can easily be deployed to go to the rig, when it comes to a woman, they're like, ah, oh no. But if you have this, this right male ally they can actually promote and say you know what she can do it let her go and then that can be done in a very smooth way also they can lead by example um, male allies can actually lead by example by demonstrating inclusive behavior honest and support for women in the workplace this can be done easily with regards to uh, policies that i believe can be done to promote women and by removing the gender bias with regards to uh, 
the industry in which we find ourselves, oil and gas industries, to advocate for policy change, whereby the male allies can be the one who will lead the policy change in an organization. For instance, in Ghana Gas, I'll give a typical example. Um, SP, we all knew SP, but it took um, the former SP chairperson in, 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 in mention of Dr. Riverson to actually advocate and push for um, more people to join SPE Ghana. And that's an initiative that came from a man. And this has led to not just women joining SPE, but a lot of people joining SPE. And I can actually say with the, with the hand on my chest that Ghana Gas actually has the highest number of people in SPE Ghana. This is because a man has led the advocacy by bringing women and men on board to an organization where we can use that same space to advocate for women by promoting, by supporting our, our careers, by amplifying our voice, by pushing for our career advancement. So I would say in conclusion that male allies actually play a critical role in challenging gender norms, promoting inclusivity, creating workplaces where women can feel valued, where women can feel respected and they can be empowered to succeed. The male ally support and advocacy are really, really essential in driving a meaningful change and advancing gender equality in the workplace. Thank you very much. Thank you. You, you didn't mention his name. Oh, I said Dr. Riversing. Okay, Dr. Riversing. Thank you so much. So it's a good example yes. for all of us. And thank you so much for sharing those exam practical examples. Uh, that we can all learn from. Um, we will quickly uh, open the floor uh, so others can join and, uh, and share their thoughts, those who have questions. And then we'll come back to you for 30 seconds each. I would like to know from each of the panelists, um, for 30 seconds, what is the one thing that you recommend that's uh, one big thing that we can all do, uh, something practical that we can and must all do uh, uh, take away from this conversation and do to help improve, inspire inspir uh, inclusion and to invest in women. So we'll come back to that at the latter day. So uh, moderator, uh, if you can please open it up so those who wish to contribute or ask questions can do so now. Thank you. Please unmute yourself and ask your question or raise your hand and uh, the moderator will mute you. Okay, maybe I will start okay. with my okay. questions. Yeah, I have a question. And any anyone at all can can answer, including you, Maoli, and any 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 of the panelists. So there's this thing that some organizations would do where um they say, okay, we there's a the the need to increase women on boards or in leadership positions. So they would um, add a woman or two here and there, but what at the end of the day, they tend to take the power away. They'll put you at the position, all right, but the power or the the yeah the power that that position held when it was previously a man, you realize that so when they give that position to a woman, that power is sort of taken away. They will either do that by creating another role just above. The woman that didn't used to exist, and then the woman will still have to go through this person, like reports to them, or maybe key information that the woman need to make her work progress very well will be kept away from her. In situations like this, what are the women and who find themselves in such situations? What are they supposed to do? Because I have people who have gone through this and it's been very frustrating. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, any more questions or contributions? All right, any of our experts, uh, panelists, please feel free to jump in on that whilst we think we wait for the next contributor. Any of the panelists who want to... Uh, okay, in the meantime, I can say that, uh, Sheena, there's something we call uh, systems thinking, uh, which is something we apply uh, when we are addressing solutions. Uh, okay, you are engineers, so you obviously know systems thinking. 
And in systems thinking, you try to understand how the system, the dynamics work. And uh, in, in, in the sector of advocating for change or fighting inequality or fighting for inclusion and um, equality, uh, we have learned that as the, one of my favorite quotes says, power consists nothing without demand. It never has and it never will. Uh, so there's always um, resistance. Uh, and when they can no longer resist, they try to pretend that they are actually giving you power without giving you power. But really, we know that uh, it's not often the case. Nobody uh, likes to concede power easily. Uh, so it's a continuous fight. So giving, creating that space may be one step, but to actually make it meaningful, uh, we have learned over and over again that it's a whole new ball game. Um, so you just there's no one solution that you can uh, deploy. Um, you have to continue to build on that. Um, there are instances where uh, you can use the law. Uh, there are systems that allow you to use the law to argue your case to make sure that you have your full power that comes with the position. There are situations where that is not an option. Uh, there are situations where you can build allies uh, with the other male to help you um, exercise your power. And there are times that people fight. They fight back, they push back. And in most cases, it causes, um, it causes them some inconvenience and sometimes it causes them their job at least. Uh, it creates a different dynamic for the next person. So there are different ways that uh, we can confront that, but it's a real challenge that a lot of women assessing power uh, will face. But as uh, one of the speakers said earlier, uh, in instances where organizations have genuinely, um, as we've learned from the Boardroom Africa, for instance, their studies have shown that organizations that genuinely uh, practice inclusion and bring women to their boards, uh, from the top organization companies in the world that they have studied, those that have uh, true representation of women, they every single one of them are performed those who don't. And uh, so there are benefits, uh, just that sometimes uh, we are unwilling to unlearn the things that make us think that women don't belong to the boardroom or to those senior positions. Any contribution to that or any more questions from the participants, please unmute yourself. Uh, Ina, please go yes. ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Well, uh, it's a very interesting topic and I can really correlate to that one. I experienced um, um, not, not let's say very similar one, but I experienced pushing back my progress in, in, in one of the companies and I really need to empower and I power, empower women to take the chance and to risk and to leave. It's important to know the timing when you need to leave. If you see that it's really not working from trying different kind of ta tactics and Mavuli, you mentioned uh, uh, brilliant ideas and tactics. Uh, I call it tactics because you know we all know that different uh, environments work differently. If you, if you come there, uh, maybe they will uh, consider you outsider. Even if you are the same culture, the same country, they can uh, they can uh, consider you as an outsider, and then you will maybe not be well accepted. And of course, if we you usually we we really care about it, and we want to uh, thrive, we want to show ourselves, and and we want to give our best. But sometimes it's better just to let it go. And this is the most important, uh, I think, um, issue. Uh, and challenge, especially for women, because we do not tend to let go of things. It's also evolutionary. It's a behavioral psychology. Uh, it's this is the obstacle uh, usually that we try to get through the wall and not just get 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 from it. You know, get out of there. And uh, I let's say I I took the step. I uh, left that position, and I can tell you it was the best possible decision I made in my life. So I encourage everyone, of course, I'm, I do not encourage you to leave your jobs. I'm just telling you that there is a, a boundary that no one should go over and uh, respect and and dignity and and uh, also thriving in the environment that we can is something that, that we should search. Everyone should search for. Thank you. 
All right, thank you so much, so much, Ina. The, Shina, I see that uh, Dr. Ann is back on. Um, Doc, are you able to uh, jump in at this point? Yeah. Okay, great. I am. Sorry. Thank you so much. Sorry, we lost you there. Thank you. Um, when you left, I was saying that they said Nigeria no, they carry last. So your so come back so that you come and uh, finish up. So we we had two quick questions for you. Unfortunately, we are out of time. But if you could do this for us in uh, two minutes, um, the first one uh, had to do with how does educational and skill development contribute to empowering women and ensuring their inclusion in sectors of the society? And there was a second part uh, that had to do with cultural shifts. Uh, we wanted to know from your experience what cultural shifts are necessary to truly inspire inclusion and in invest in women effectively. So it's a two part. If you could please do it for us in two minutes, we'll appreciate it. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you so much. And I'm very, very quickly before I'm thrown out again. So it's commonly said that when you educate a woman, you educate a community. And so, of course, when you educate and empower a woman, you are actually empowering a full society. So education and skill development are fundamental concepts, you know, for um, empowering women and ensuring their full inclusion. Um, inclusion in every sector you find themselves it helps them enhance economic opportunities you know because when you when you're well equipped with education and the right skills it you're able to participate in the various sectors of the economy it helps them to break gender stereotypes like we're doing as female engineers in the oil and gas sector where of course the men will not give you any chance and you have to bring what your onions and bring all you know to the table so all that can be done to women to participate, you know, in areas, leadership roles and decision making um, roles. Come to think about it politically, Africa has a con has the, as a continent has about 54 countries, if I'm not right, a female president has ever emerged. That's about 11%. It's nothing to really celebrate, but then, then again, it's we've come thus far because these women were well educated and they knew, you know, right up there what they had to deliver. Because getting a spot on the table doesn't come easy. You need to bring, you know, all your education and expertise to the table to be allowed a spot to even speak and your voice to even be heard. So ed education can the the importance of education, quality, well informed decision about their health and also about their children's health and of course about about the the their families as well it also helps them be better role models you know, to the upcoming generation, harassment, sexual harassment and exploitation. If you are in a, in a, in a workplace where you are sort of subject to some sort of harassment, just to be able to remain on the job. But of course, when you're well-educated, you will be well um, informed and, and you, you, you would have to cut and be well inclusive, included in, in um, the work place or wherever you find yourselves and coming to cultural shifts of course there are a lot of cultural shifts especially african cultural shifts that we think needs to be done to truly inclusion when it comes to women first of all property that we know we're denied the right to own properties where well, well, we and that and this of course limits economic independence of the women so some cultures see women has properties that that are supposed to be inherited right and that is discriminates against the women you have other cultural practices like the female um, genital mutilation which actually still happens even in my country and i'm sure in some other countries in the african continent and you know the, the world at large you have cultural um cultural practice, practices like child marriages and some sort of gender-based violence. All of that are things that we think we need to have a shift. Challenging gender stereotype, we need to uphold 
and challenge all stereotypes that have put women in the in the kitchen. Sorry to use that word. Even it starts with us, not just the um, not just the men. How many of you have we as women having a male and a female child will say to all girl, um, join me in the kitchen, let's go and cook. And then the, the boys are to be playing, right? And so all of that has to start from the home, from we as women, and then from to the, to the general society. The whole lot of fost fostering cultural shifts will prioritize gender equality. It will prioritize um, gender inclusion and help of us live an equitable and prosperous society. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Anne. And we are grateful to the Nigeria Internet there for uh, staying put. The, you, when you were talking about uh, the recommendations, you talked about the importance of education. You mentioned how uh, educated the women who have been able to attain presidency on the continent were uh, and how that education allowed them to attain. And then, I thought to myself, I was like, here you are with two PhDs, uh, with two successive presidents who uh, have their only certificates, all of them have their certificates missing. And it's, it will be impossible for a woman whose only certificates are missing to uh, become president because the first thing everybody asks is, show us your qualification or what you bring to the table. So that just shows uh, how real the struggle is. Thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. We can take one more or two more questions or contributions, and then we'll come back to the panelists for their 30 seconds. One important recommendation of what we can do moving forward uh, as individuals uh, to bring about inclusion and invest in women. Uh, so the floor is open again. Uh, we can take two more contributions, quick ones, and then we conclude. Someone has a hands up. Oh, okay, that's Phyllis. Phyllis, go ahead. Um, good afternoon, and thank you all for this um, opportunity, and happy International Women's Day to you all. Um, I have a question, and um, it has to do with them. Um, it's slightly off topic, but um, there is one thing that we need to address, and that is the abuse of power by women when given the opportunity to, to, to lead or to have a leadership role. Um, I don't know if we've been following Amer um, American politics, but um, what has been making the news recently is um, one district uh, attorney uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, who's pr um, currently prosecuting pres uh, the former president of the United States, she is currently being accused of uh, conflicts of interest. And then there is one mayor of a small town in uh, uh, the state of Illinois who's uh, uh, currently being accused of uh, corruption. That is a misappropriation of taxpayers' money for um, personal gains. And when these ladies have been confronted with, um, with, with, with these issues, they have, they have dis so far, they have displayed so much um, arrogance, so much arrogance and paucity and pride. So as part of investing in women, what can we do to curb such abuse of power by, 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 by fellow women? Thank you. Thank you so much, Phyllis. Uh, anyone else quickly before we move to the concluding remarks? Any final comments? All right. Uh, Phyllis, thank you so much. From your name, I take it that you are speaking from Ghana. Yes, please. Thank you. Oh, okay. Great. All right. So uh, this is a, a common uh, question that we always have to deal with. Um, yeah. The truth is, the bottom line is, uh, our advocacy for women's inclusion in leadership does not mean that they are angels. Uh, and they commit no sins. Uh, but there is absolutely no crime or sin that you have shared that you will not find a thousand times more men doing uh, in similar positions. So it's not unique to women. There are many women who are serving with honor, 
with integrity, with efficiency and impact. Uh, but there is also the question of uh, those few women who uh, falter in their positions of power. We have examples in all our countries. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, for every one of those, you'll find a thousand men uh, who have done worse. Uh, we have thousand and one men in powerful position, in presidential positions, attorney general positions, uh, who have been repeatedly accused of uh, sexual offenses, including the president you mentioned uh, in the United States. Um, so yes, so it's not a unique thing that should discourage, but part of what we do when we invest in women's leadership is also to invest in their moral and ethical leadership development. And so we can't just assume there are some people that have those uh, positive stereotypes that say that, oh, women will not be corrupt, women are angels, women will do everything right. It is not true. Uh, developing a leader also means that you invest in their ethical values uh, and principles. And women leaders are human beings too, so they falter. So we have to consider that in our leadership development efforts. And uh, so with that, we'll go to our panelists for uh, they are concluding remarks, 30 seconds each if they can. Uh, if you want to respond to the last question that was asked before you go to your one powerful recommendation, please feel free to do so. Uh, Carla, we'll start with you. Thank you. Uh, I think it, you, that you have answered very well <laughs> the last question. Basically, is that we are women and uh, we are human and... Uh, it is the same with men also. You gave a very good answer, thank you. So what do one can do? I can tell my experience. My parents financed my education up to university and they were instrumental in instilling confidence in me in several years. So each one of us can take the commitment to start from his home, from his or her home community by providing opportunity for education. Miss Han, she talked extensively about this. Education is the key for, for success, for development, for knowledge. So uh, investing in women and keeping them with resource and the opportunity to promote their social and economic growth, fulfillment and empowerment is what uh, I would recommend and is what uh, I will do when I'm doing on, a, on my daily basis. Thank you so much, Carla. Walking the talk and directly investing, uh, investing in girls' education and empowerment. Thank you so much. Uh, Ina, can we have your recommendation as well? And if you sure. want to respond to the last question as well, please feel free to do so. I think I will agree with Katla. I really agree completely with you on, on the answer on the last one. Thank you for that one. As my final uh, words uh, for today, not forever, just for today, I would uh, just emphasize the power of uh, uh, being kind to each other, especially women to women. Uh, through my career and also my friendships and, and my, uh, let's say, circle that I am, um, at and at what I was, I saw a lot of competitiveness and a lot of, uh, um, a lot of, uh, um, not let's say kindness and and no supportive environment, especially between women. So I really embrace uh, the opportunity of every woman supporting other ones, and I like the sentence, you know, be the one that is just helping other to wear the crown. And, and not the one who is uh, diminishing other one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ina. And uh, Dr. Anne. Thank you so very much, Mr. Jackie. So um, one of my very favorite Bible passage says, as you will that men do unto you, do you also unto them likewise. And bringing it down back home, I'd like to say by investing in women, we're investing in the future, but more personally, by investing in women, we are investing in ourselves. So it begins with us. As we want others to do for us, we need to start doing it for ourselves. So in line with what Ina said, I would like to say, let's see of more, let's see more women encouraging women. Women support women 
and women encourage women. Because if you do not sing your song, no one else will. If you do not sing your song loud enough, no one else would even want to listen to you. So here is a call to action. Let's continue to harness the power of inclusivity and let's continue to mentor our young ones, especially the girls, because that is only where we can ensure a truly inclusive and prosperous society. And thank you so much on behalf of SP Worry Session. I want to wish us all a very happy International Women's Day. Thanks for having me, Ghana Session. Thank you, Mr. Thank you so much, Carla. That was powerfully said. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Ina. And thank you, Dr. Anne. I will hand over to Sheena uh, for the concluding remarks. And uh, just to share that Carla and I, um, Carla's example, not Carla, Sheena's example, uh, we support an initiative that invests in uh, young girls who are the first from their family, generations in their family to ever go to university. And you can't believe how many times I've had to call Sheena. And uh, sometimes the money is not there and then uh, she will allocate her next salary uh, and factor them in there. And she even goes beyond that. Uh, many of the times when I talk to the girls, uh, they saw she called me or she sent me pocket money uh, last month. Uh, so I just wanted to share that uh, as someone, as Sheena, as someone who works really, really works a talk uh, when it comes to investing uh, in younger girls and mentoring them. And so with that, I hand over to you, Sheena. And thank you all, and happy International Women's Day. Oh, Molly, you just had to put me on the spot there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to also invest in, in young girls. And um, thank you all so very much. In fact, every time we try to have such talks. Sometimes the questions are, we are always having these talks. Do we learn anything new? Is it just about talks? But trust me, I learned a lot today. So let's not stop um, this conversations. It's really important. Um, I don't know if the chair for worry is on the call. Dr. Ann, do you know if he's on the call? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Ah, I'm great. I'm okay. listening patiently to everything that you guys have been saying. So. <laughs> All right, please. We would like you to give the closing remarks. Okay. Um, My job is always simple. Like I always say, the harder jobs have been done by the panelists and the moderators. So kudos to you guys. Very, very seasoned panel, very articulate panel, and uh, very healthy conversation as well. I want to, you know, appreciate all of you for your contribution. And uh, talking about the inclusion, I think um, we are not where we used to be, you know, even if we are not where we are supposed to be. Because um, if you look at actually the energy industry, you find out that, um, you know, the level of uh, inclusion now, the awareness, thanks to SPE and the uh, likes of SPE that have been speaking up for the diversity and inclusion, because you find out that um, in the energy industries and the academia, the women are actually you know, being put in the positions that they were not, you know, used to be in time past. So we are doing very well. So like um, you said, Shina was talking about if uh, we just talk and uh, we are not getting anything. I think uh, our messages are actually reaching out and it's affecting yeah, the way decisions are being made, the way, you know, inclusion is being taken now. It's not like the way it used to be. So awareness, the awareness we are creating is a very awesome one. And um, I can tell you for free that it's actually making a lot of waves. So I, again, I want to say thank you to all the sections, all the panelists from different African sections. In Africa, like I said earlier, we are not where we are supposed to be in terms of inclusion, but we are doing better. But the area I wanted to actually hinge on is what most of the panelists used in rounding up. You know, in the area of uh, politics, in the area of uh, governance, yeah? The women have not really been, uh, you know, the inclusion have not really favored them the way it has favored them like in the industry, actually like the energy industry. But again, I liked what many of the panelists concluded with. 
by saying that women need to support women. I think that's where the problem actually is. Because if you see a woman coming out now for governor, I can tell you for free that many of the women will not vote for that person. I'm talking, I'm speaking about for like Nigeria, for instance. They will campaign against her. They will not support her. And, you know, most times we use our parlance to say, ah, waiting woman, do woman. You know? So, what is, so women need to support themselves more. They need to do it more. Yeah, because if you check about inclusion, now you find that men support women more than women are supporting women. So we need to have that that change of uh, mindset, change of paradigm, you know, from women not wanting to support themselves. Because if you don't speak for yourself, nobody can actually speak for you the way you will speak for yourself. So I think on that note, um, a lot have been said. I want to wish each and every one of us, especially the ladies, the very, very special International Women's Day for 2024. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Doc. And it would interest you to know that one of the major political parties in Ghana yesterday just announced um, the running mates for the presidential candidates. And is a woman. She, this is the second yeah, time for, that she, for, she's... God need to vote for her, not just... Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. She, so we, we have... She's so far been the first female running mate, Molly, if I'm not mistaken, for Ghana. So, yeah, for the for the for the major parties. Major yes. parties, okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, because we've had Bridget Jogbenuku for PPP. Yeah, that's true. And so yeah, everything has been said. And thank you so much, Maoli. Um, I know you had so many things to do today, but you chose to spend your day with us, and we are very, very grateful for that. We truly appreciate you and all that you do. In championing the cause for women and girls, keep doing it. And um, like we always say in Ghana, would would never end anything without saying God bless you. So <laughs> <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. And to Ina, to Carla, to Dr. Anne, and to Rupa, but keep walking the talk because that is the only way we can also inspire other girls. Representation always matter when the young girls see us doing it and being what we want to be, then it can also inspire them to do more. Um, before we go, some very quick announcements, um, especially from the Ghana front. Um, on tomorrow, which is the 9th and then the 16th and 23rd of March, um, continuing with our SPE career guidance, we are doing capacity building program on 3D modeling. So any one of you on the call who would want to know more about 3D modeling, kindly follow up on all our social media pages to get the, the, um, the details on this particular meeting so that you can join. In. It's the, the first one is tomorrow, the 9th, and then the subsequent ones will be 16th, 23rd, and 30th. So the Zoom details will be on all our social media um pages and then also on the 28th of march we have another collaboration between spe ghana spe uganda spe south africa spe namibia spe worry worry you know the carry lasso <laughs> spe tanzania SP Germany and again sp vienna section so yes a, a very big collaboration on that one and we are talking about energy perspective what is happening so please um again look for all our social media handles especially on linkedin instagram facebook and twitter and uh, look for the the zoom login details in may we have one of our biggest um conferences for SP Ghana, and that will be on the 20th of May, and it will be happening at the British Council. And the, our main topic for this is embracing innovation, redefining the future of the oil and gas industry in Africa. 
this is open to all so we hope you put this in your calendar the following day we have the um young africa young professional workshop and debate where we would have all other young professionals from all the other sections across africa coming to ghana for this so we'll be very happy if you would put this in your calendar and join us Th these are all in person not virtual so we've come to the end of today's um, section. Again, thank you all our um, online guests, everyone who joined online to make this program a success. Thank you very much. We recorded this section, so you would find it on our YouTube channel. If you want to refer to it any day, any time, you would find it over there. Just type SP Ghana section. The same name you will find on LinkedIn, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So, yeah, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day and keep safe. Bye bye. bye, bye. Thank you so much. Thank it was you. a pleasure. It was bye. a pleasure as well. Bye. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great, great program. Well done. Well done, ladies. Thank you. Bye. Are you not going to share Ghana jollof rice in this uh, International Women's Day? <laughs> Dog, you just need to get on a flight and come. You eat plenty uh, Ghana jollof. <laughs> are you not sharing Ghana jollof? I don't understand. Though. You just, we are uh, sharing, oh, Dog. <laughs>